I think it's a chance for us to get everything right. I don't think we would have dealt with the environment if, unless this had come up, come about. We wouldn't have dealt with wealth inequality, income inequality. Uh, we wouldn't have dealt with uh, political divis- divisiveness. I mean, every the, the death of truth. I mean, everything that we valued and was falling away. And people go, oh, you know, that's just too bad. But by what time? What time is the yacht leaving? I mean, because their personal lives are doing well. Uh, President Bill Clinton once told me, it's hard to get somebody to agree to the truth when the lie is paying their paycheck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is so true in so many different areas. When you can rationalize your state state of life, why would you change it? And to rationalize is to tell rational lies. So COVID just stopped all of that and said, we gotta have to reimagine life because what we've been doing is not sustainable. So now you need to convince anybody to deal with these issues because the issues have dealt with us. One of the lessons I've learned in martial arts is that standing still is asking to be hit. If you stand still in business, your competition is gonna catch up. I start each morning practicing martial arts because it brings me balance and focus. And I want to know how others stay motivated as well. So join me for conversations on business, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I'm Dan Schulman. Welcome to Never Stand Still. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Schulman, the president and CEO of PayPal. And welcome to another episode of Never Stand Still. I'm thrilled today to have a good friend, John Hope Bryant, uh, on with me. Um, John's got a long resume, and I'm going to go through it as uh, as quickly as I possibly can here. I'm going to embarrass him, and no doubt. Um, but um, you can be real many, quick. <laughs> many of you uh, might know John as the uh, founder and CEO of Operation Hope. Uh, it's a global nonprofit. It's located in Atlanta. It was founded in 1992 in response to sort of the despair and devastation that was associated with the L.A. riots. I lived in L.A. at that time, and uh, I saw firsthand exactly uh, what inspired uh, John. And it is focused on providing financial literacy, financial inclusion, and economic empowerment tools and services to those who are disenfranchised. And the great thing about Operation Hope is it's had tremendous impact. It's empowered uh, almost some 3 million individuals. And when I talk about empowered, it's basically turned people who are check cashing customers into banking customers, people who were renting into homeowners, small business dreamers, people who only dreamed of starting a small business, actually becoming small business owners. And they've uh, directed, um, I think it's about $3.2 billion of uh, economic activity into these uh, underserved communities and neighborhoods that so desperately need that infusion of capital. But John is not just an entrepreneur, although he's done unbelievable things there. He's an author. He's a philanthropist. And I would say uh, that John is one of the most prominent thought leaders uh, around economic empowerment and financial dignity. And John, I find this hard to believe because you can't be old enough for this to be true. Uh, But uh, John's been recognized by the last five presidents of the United States. Um, He is an advisor or has been an advisor to the last three uh, sitting uh, presidents. And um, John, you must have a resume that is like 400 pages long because he has received uh, over 500 notable awards and citations for all of his work. Oprah Winfrey, Uh, recognized John with the Use Your Life Award. Time Magazine recognized John as one of the uh, top 50 leaders for the future. And as I mentioned, he's a best-selling author. Last count that I saw, John, was at least three books um, that are on the best-selling list. I'm sure there are more, but uh, uh, you're too humble probably to acknowledge that. And John is... He's a great guy. He is full of energy. He is dedicated to sharing both 
his successes and actually his failures to inspire so many of us um, who are so concerned about the state of our union, the state of our economy, the state of uh, the uh, of our communities, of the racial uh, systemic racial uh, injustices uh, that uh, surround us right now, and. John, I couldn't be more happy to have you on the show. So thank you for being here. Uh, I'm honored to be with you, Dan. Um, thank you for that overly gracious uh, introduction. Um, I am wearing this T-shirt for you today uh, because uh, I think you stand for and live your life with integrity. And uh, I met you through another friend, John uh, and who's now CEO of Nike, yep. um, who I believe is on your board. Yep, chairman. Uh, uh, chairman of your board. And John, just like you, had this sense of mission and wanted to do the right thing. We were, now, we were at some place, uh, without naming names, we were someplace where it was so easy to check out and for the wealthy just to be wealthy. I was just an invited guest. But it was so easy for those who have it just to focus on those who have it. But yet you and John were obsessed with getting this conversation. Uh, and when you and I got together, as if the world fell away. And the conversation that you decided to have with me, which was equivalent of giving away half of your compensation uh, to those people you did not know, I thought was extraordinary. You didn't know me from a, a hole in the ground, but we clicked instantly. And I, as you know, Dan, I asked you not to do that. Uh, we can get into it, uh, but I asked you not to give away your half your compensation because the next CEO after you might not. And um, now you got people hooked on graciousness that doesn't get, it's not sustainable. And also, I'm convinced people don't want to hand out, they want to hand up. And there's not enough money in your compensation or 20 CEOs like you to solve these problems. We can't give people self-esteem. And so I, we talked, you and I, about what a hand up strategy looked like, not a handout strategy, and how that might truly empower people to do for themselves and create them their, their own Dan Showman story. Yeah. And uh, you went off and did much more than that. And I commend you on the five hundred and fifty plus million dollar commitment you just made uh, and the company around um, not just black economic empowerment, but empowerment of the of the least of these God's children. And it wasn't just money, it was leadership, it's internships, it's mentorships, it's diversity, it's, it's using your budget as a company as a, as a, as a measure of your values. Um, and if other leaders did that, we would be in a much better place. Yeah. John, you know, there are certain conversations in life that impact you for a long time uh, to come. And that conversation we had, and you also set me up with a Couple of other leaders who uh, were Delta. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, to talk to and uh, to think about uh, how we could leverage so much more um, and lean in in ways that are ongoing and uh, and lasting. Um, and so I thank you for that conversation and and, uh, and the ones we've had uh, since then. So, um, John, let me, um, I've got maybe four or five questions for you that I think would be really helpful for people. Uh, but I have a question for you before you ask that. Uh, okay. Why do you care so much? You know, look, look, you're, doing, you're doing this podcast. You don't need to do this. You're the CEO of PayPal. Look, you can just chill. You can go get, get your paycheck, get your stock options. You're making a crap load of money. You're, le you're, you're one leading one of the most important companies in the world. You're doing a service for small business just by your very existence through PayPal's. What you do is empower small business. You're employing people. You're a fair and decent human being. You don't have to do this stuff. No good deeds shall go unpunished. Why do you work yourself to the bones? Why do you care so dang on much? What is it? I love it, but what? Is, I need everybody to get infected by this. What is it? Yeah, you know, um, John, it's something I think that comes from the very earliest memories that I have um, as a kid. You know, it, these, like, my dad always said, son, the one thing you can't choose is your parents. 
Um, and, um, and I'm so glad that I didn't have any choice in that because um, they were uh, advocates for social justice before like people were talking about any of that. My mom and dad were early, early supporters of the civil rights uh, movement. My mom marched uh, with me in the baby carriage. One of the things that's most vivid to me uh, in my childhood is my dad um, uh, was a manager of a chemical plant um, in uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And the uh, plant manager down there fired uh, one of their black employees for drinking at the wrong water fountain. And you remember these days, these are days where like racial tensions were incredibly high and violence could occur at any time. Yeah. And uh, my dad traveled down, we lived in uh, New Jersey, in Newark, New Jersey at the time. Oh, yeah. He traveled down to Pascagoula, Mississippi to reverse that uh, firing. And he said to that white uh, woman, you cannot fire this individual, that is not something that uh, will happen on my watch. And I remember my mom waiting by the phone for my dad's call, just hoping he was going to be okay. Um, and, you know, these things are seared into you uh, as you grow up. And um, what, what year was that, Dan? That had to be like about 1964, 1963. Right in the middle of the civil rights movement, right in the middle of it. My, yep. mentor, my mentor, my play father, as you know, Ambassador Andrew Young was Dr. King's right arm in that civil rights movement, was on the balcony when Dr. King was assassinated. And he was probably, you know, within a few hundred miles of where you or where your father was in 64. Yeah. Um, they were in the same fight. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of the beginning of it. And then just as I've gotten older, um, I realized that... Uh, Taking advantage of what we've learned and turning it outward is probably the single biggest gift that we have. And uh, and so something I know that inspires you and uh, it'll be something that inspires me for the rest of my life as well. Yeah, it's interesting that I'm so glad I asked you a story, Dan, because if you think about it, civil rights is about keeping bad things from happening to good people. Um, and. That's what your dad did. He kept yeah. a bad thing from happening to a good person. He was a moving civil rights tool from the private sector in 1964. And silver rights, S-I-L-V-E-R, yeah. which happens in the suites, not the streets, is about strengthening yourself so that you can help other people be good so that there are less people have a reason to be bad but also to strengthen yourself and protect yourself in case somebody punches through civil rights lines and begins to impinge upon your civil rights uh, freedom opportunities. That civil rights, those economic and financial empowerment strength that my Jewish brothers and sisters have had to learn how to use also over uh, a few hundred years um, so they can relate. Uh, this civil rights strength is what I see you doing now with your recent initiatives to empower people uh, with not black or white as in race, but green as in U.S. currency, uh, with wealth. Uh, and in some ways, you are just continuing a proud legacy from your father and your mother in your own way, but with a software upgrade. This is about yeah. what we're for, not what we're against. Yeah. This is well, about you and I growing up the poverty. Yeah. Uh, you and I have both believed for a long time, as uh, for many, many years of our lives, uh, we've been focused on this, that financial health is foundational for people. When people are struggling every single day to get by, you know, as you've mentioned, and I've used numbers well, 185 million people, adults in our country struggling to get by every single month, when that's happening, you know, they don't have the same dreams anymore. They don't have the same opportunities anymore. And then, like, they lose hope. 
It's so kind of interesting that your organization is called Operation Hope because I think financial health, economic empowerment enables you to at least have the beginnings of hope and maybe apply that. And that's why Dr. King in his last movement in 68 was trying to push down a movement of poor whites. There's more poor whites than anybody, poor anybody else in this country then and now. Poor blacks, Latinos, Indians, Asians, African Americans. He wanted his last movement was about everybody and getting them up into the system and up the economic ladder because, and this is a Dr. King quote from 68, you cannot legislate goodness. You cannot pass a law to force someone to respect you. The only way to social justice in a capitalist country is economics and ownership. That's a key, that's a quote that nobody knows that Dr. King ever uttered. And he, he uttered that quote right before he was assassinated in, in a, on, a, on a balcony in Memphis in April of 68. And if you think about it, Dan, um, our white brothers and sisters, our poor whites who came here as chateau slavery, as, as indentured servants in 1619, along with black slaves as well, um, to this day, they're still suffering. And in some ways, I'd argue, they rioted at the ballot box three and a half years ago because no one had been listening to them for 70 years. So they rioted at the ballot box. You will listen to me. And my black and brown friends rioted in the streets three and a half weeks ago uh, because they said, you will listen. Someone's going to listen to me. And both of those things uh, are emotional reactions to a real problem. Neither one solves anything. It may actually make it worse, as we've seen uh, in many cases uh, uh, with regard to our public space. We're getting more and more divided. The Bible says that a house divided cannot stand. It's biblical. It's also math. Um, you, you, everybody knows that bridges are more important than walls. We all know that America survives and thrives because we're a global economy where the walls are down. And we are the only nation in the world where every race of people is within our borders. And we benefit from trading with the world because the world finds the place uh, our magic sauce called freedom. It's not just because we have great products, but because we have great spirit. And uh, and and so uh, I think that that we've got to solve problems not just for our black and brown brothers and sisters, but for our poor white brothers and sisters as well. And and as you just noted, you know, seventy percent of middle class Americans didn't have sorry, sixty four percent of all Americans didn't have four hundred dollars in time for an unplanned event before COVID nineteen. Yeah, and 70% of us lived from paycheck to paycheck before COVID-19 with too, with too much month at the end of their money. What does that do to their self-esteem, their anxiety level, their hypertension, their propensity for obesity, eating themselves into unhealth with bad food? Uh, what does it do to their lack of hope, their depression levels? Uh, do they see the glasses half full? In which case you say, I'm doing well, I want you to do well too. Or do you see the glass is half empty, which is, you know what, I resent you. Uh, I should be proud of you, whoever you are, but I resent you because I should have that. And see, that becomes a slippery slope. And that's why leaders like you who light a candle versus cursing the darkness are so incredibly important at this time. History does not feel historic when you're sitting in it, Dan. Mm -hmm. It just feels like another day. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that the moment we are in is not exactly and precisely history in the making, historic. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because we are living through, to some extent, some extraordinary times right now. You've got a global health pandemic sweeping through the world right now. No signs of that slowing down. Yeah. You've got an economic crisis with all-time high unemployment right now. Then, as you mentioned, in the last... Uh, three weeks, we've seen this pent up sort of explosion happen around social injustice, around systemic racism in our country. And I think, I think these things have all exposed things like you were talking about that have been there, but people have not acted upon. And I'm kind of curious, like, do you think this is a unique moment in time because of all of those things where we might be able to engender change. Oh, no doubt about it. Rainbows only follow storms, Dan. Mm -hmm. It's a scientific fact, actually. Rainbows only follow storms. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. No one changes in good times. Why would you? Yeah. Right? <laughs> People only change in bad times. They only change through what I call legitimate suffering. 
Um, and I think if God wanted, I'm a spiritual person, let me use the word God. If God wanted us dead, we'd be dead. This would not be a reset, it'd be a reboot, okay? COVID would have killed us. I mean, but interesting, you know, we can see the other side of this. We just need to get there. And, but it stopped everybody. It stopped rich people, poor people, it stopped billionaires, millionaires, hundredaires, somebody trying to buy some men. It stopped black, white, rich, poor, conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, right? And then on the heels of that, you then have the George Floyd incident, right on the heels of that, and you have this, uh, uh, this almost, a me too, uh, almost a Me Too racial moment yeah. where you got to deal with this 400-year scab. And the way I describe this issue with, uh, uh, on race is this. You've got a mother-in-law. Uh, and it was so to, by the way, to your other point, I think there's a chance for us to get everything right. I don't think we would have dealt with the environment if, unless this had come, come about. We wouldn't have dealt with wealth inequality, income inequality. Uh, we wouldn't have dealt with uh, political division, divisiveness. I mean, every the, the death of truth. I mean, everything that we valued and was falling away. And people go, oh, you know, that's just too bad. But by what time? What time is the yacht leaving? I mean, because their personal lives are doing well. Uh-huh. President Bill Clinton once told me, it's hard to get somebody to agree to the truth when the lie is paying their paycheck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is so true in so many different areas. When you can rationalize your state, your state of life, why would you change it? And to rationalize is to tell rational lies. So COVID just stopped all of that and said, uh, we don't have to reimagine life because what we've been doing is not sustainable. So now you need to convince anybody to deal with these issues because the issues have dealt with us. Number two, the racial issue. You know, imagine a mother-in-law. You're my mother-in-law, and we have some slight we've delivered upon them three years ago. They didn't say anything. We didn't say anything. We never healed. Uh, we never talked about it. We see each other at Christmas, give each other a church hug. Not a real hug, not this, but <laughs> this, and keep it moving. What happens over time, Dan? Resentment. We yes. smile. We pass each other. We're talking, we're talking, but we're not really listening. We're listening, but we're not hearing. Uh, we're, we're talking, we're not communicating. Uh, we're not resolving. We're, resp- we're reacting, we're not responding. Over, and then something happens, and you really need your mother-in-law's back on something, uh, and she explodes on you and, uh, and takes all her resentments out on you in that moment, and you go, where did that come from? My point here, and everybody can relate to this story, my point here is that that's the three-year-old slight with a mother-in-law Imagine a 400-year-old slight mm-hmm. from an entire race of people. And here's the, and, and by the way, this is not a guilt trip. I'm, I'm not, this is not emotional. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I love math because it doesn't have an opinion. Yeah, it's a great point, John. Dan, Dan here's the math. <laughs> 40 years ago, we broke America's promise. Forget slavery. Forget the moral issues. That, that's just horrible. The promise is that if you work hard, play by the rules, you get the, the, the fruit of the, your own labor. This is, as a, this is American as, I don't know, you know, Ameri- you know, independence and freedom and apple pie. You work hard and with these hands. This is, you know, people, I do for yourself. And you're going to get a benefit of that late. We're in agreement, Dan? Yes, that's the American that's, dream. That's, it, that's core. Yep. It doesn't matter what political party, it doesn't matter what race. In fact, the most conservative people I know, this is the one thing that they, they're like, they're like, why people are so lazy? Use your hand. Okay. 40 years ago, we brought slaves from, sorry, we brought Africans who were brilliant uh, agric- uh, agricultural geniuses from Africa to here because they, knew they could work the soil when others couldn't and they could work it all day. <laughs> and we put them on plantations. And it's interesting that you said your family, your dad went to this little place in Mississippi because the richest city in the in a world in 1850, Dan, in the world per capita was not just Mississippi. In the world, mm. because they imported slaves who worked yeah. the cotton fields and the cotton gin, which that, that technology made slaves, slavery would have died, but slavery became very efficient. Slavery became very efficient because of the cotton gin and the cotton mill, that technology, which by the way is where uh, a lot of things in Silicon Valley later came from, that made slave trade very profitable. That was based in not just Mississippi. The word millionaire also came from the, in the same year as not just Mississippi was the wealthiest city. That came in New York City in 1850 from the financiers who financed all the, financed all the cotton trade, insured it, financed it, and, and did the import-export. So 
so but but who didn't benefit? So here I am. I'm working in that. I'm working twelve hours in that field. I'm working. I'm working. I'm working. I'm working. And then the big house, uh, the the big house gets bigger. The man in the big house, he gets richer. He gets uh, a, a horse and buggy, call it a Cadillac today, or a Mercedes, or a Bentley. Yeah. Uh, then I work harder, and he he gets a room addition. <laughs> and I work harder, and he gets some more. Uh, we call it house manager day. He gets some more uh, maids. I'm working. I'm working. But his his house is getting bigger. That's called a reverse transfer of wealth. So if you had a reverse transfer of wealth, not for two years, three years, it's this 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 agreement with our mother-in-law, which is not financial in nature, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's bad enough. Yeah, but it's not financial in nature. And this went on for three hundred years, and another fifty years of almost a hundred years of, uh, of of commercial slavery, which is you you know basically you get arrested and you sit you you, you get sent back to basically to work it off at a plantation. But the point here is. Of course, now you have people with who are African American who have a net worth of eight thousand dollars, and their white brothers sisters have a net worth of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. What do you expect? Yeah. <laughs> even yeah. the government got in the game in the seventies. The government would not even guarantee an FHA loan, uh, a HUD loan in a black neighborhood. The, the government was supposed to protect, protect you. So my, my this again, what I say to the people, then I'm not trying to guilt trip you. I'm not trying to get you all worked up. I'm trying to understand the math. If this happened to you, you'd be upset too. Of course, of <laughs> and course. We didn't get a memo on financial literacy, and you know it, that's the Freedmen's Bank, you know, 1865. And so, of course, we have ghettos and prosperous neighborhoods. And where George Floyd was murdered is a 570 credit score neighborhood. Check cashing next to a payday loan lender, next to a rent to own store, next to a title lender, next to a liquor store. And where you and I live, class versus race. That's a 700 credit score neighborhood, and those predators don't exist. Prosperity exists. So we've got two worlds in America. But, Dan, this problem we can fix. It's a math problem. Yeah. Hey, so you've actually talked about a solution. You've talked about something called the new Marshall Plan, which is legislation that aims to think about economic empowerment, education, those kinds of things. Can can you talk a little bit about that, John? Like, how do how do all of us get involved in helping with this idea of financial health, of you know, erasing uh, or narrowing the racial wealth gap, of thinking about how do we turn? Which, and this is the first generation ever where the majority of Americans don't feel that they will do better than their parents did, that they will do worse. That, you know, is now the majority of people. So can you talk a little bit about this idea that you have and how we can all rally around that? I'd be honored to do it. And people can download it, by the way. They can just type in my name in the new Marshall Plan. It'll come up. It's an eight, 10-point plan. And really, with Dan, with, again, what PayPal has done under your leadership without anybody's urging, and before I publish this, is really part and part, is a great example of the private sector's leadership role. If you go through my Marshall Plan, you've probably done half of them already yourself, internships, apprenticeships, uh, uh, you know, uh, financial literacy, I mean, uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. Can I give a bit, one minute of backdrop, though, that I think is important, Dan? Yeah, of course. Um, we've been here before. Um, after the Great Depression, America stumbled. She just stumbled around for 20 years. And uh, it was World War II um, that mobilized us. And we ended up with this huge public spending campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the equivalent of a trillion dollars today, trillion yeah. dollars today, but it was billions, it was hundreds of billions back then. Uh, it probably the equivalent of my guess is would be equivalent of ten trillion dollars today, and we poured all this money into this uh, war machine. But it was private companies, by the way, being funded by the government. And it was after World War II uh, that we had a Marshall Plan, and that Marshall Plan did a couple of things. One, it rebuilt the nations that had bombed us, so he, what, uh, Germany and Japan specifically, right, and. Uh, people talk about welfare, but the you know the largest rebuilding exercise of the World Bank in the history of the world was France. Nobody knows that. We spent more money rebuilding France than any place else. 
uh, but that's not the image. So we, but who are our two allies today? Germany and Japan. Who are our trading partners today? Germany and Japan, right? Mm-hmm. So it, that wasn't a handout. That was an investment, right? And that uh, that unleashed us as a global. You had to have foresight to see that, John. Yes, yes, you did. The Bible says, "Well, there's no, there's no vision that people perish." So I, I'm hopeful that people will see that. Now, my point though is that that was not some gimme program. That was not some liberal giveaway program. That unleashed America as a global superpower. We were not a superpower before then. And then the second thing we did for those returning home, it was a GI Bill. And we've said to every returning GI, we're going we're to give you as much education as you can shove down your throat. And this was the biggest uptick, by the, this resulted in the biggest uptick, Dan, in college-educated Americans in the history of this country. My dad went to college on the GI Bill. Excuse me? My dad went to college on the GI Bill. Yeah. Uh, my father, too, that I, now that I think about it. I hadn't thought about it to this moment. So, and by the way, where did black middle class come from, Dan? Because we were locked out of the economy. So black doctors, why who didn't want black people working on them? It came through the military. Black attorneys came through the military. The professional class of black people came through, the, through public service in the military, which is why you have black professionals and not black entrepreneurs. But that's another podcast for another time. We don't have time to get into that. But people, <laughs> what, what you focus on grows. So because you had blacks in the professional classes in the military, that's what grew. Okay, so now, so you have a, the, the, a, as much education you shove down your throat. Uh, a mortgage for a new home. Now you have equity yep. for uh, your first wealth building exercise, a home, all right, which is where you and I, or maybe our maybe our parents. No, no, you and I got the capital to start a business or go to a, a, mortgage, a home equity loan to go to the college. And they had equity to play with. And then the third thing uh, uh, was an apprenticeship for a job for the future. So if you look at my new Marshall Plan, uh, essentially I put that on steroids. Uh, I've said we need uh, America cannot survive as a superpower in the world. But half of its, its, of its citizens with a high school education, which is the reality today. I, I want your viewers and listeners to think about what I just said. Half of America has a high school education. Mm-hmm. One of the ways you banish racism and bias and ignorance is through education and exposure. Do you have racists who are college educated? Of course you do. But it is really much harder to do when you have more experience in it, you got to be really a knucklehead to continue to be a racist once you understand this world. Even math, science tells you that our DNA is exactly the same. So again, once you start understanding that 99% of our DNA is precisely the same, and you understand that, that you probably have some black blood in your body, and I've got white blood in my body, how do I hate you without hating me? But again, ignorance is bliss. So education for all, K through college, my Marshall Plan suggests K through college is a new norm, Dan, not K through high school. Yeah. It suggests also that education should be a public good, not a private asset. Right now, uh, you can go to a private good college and everybody else goes to a crappy, I guess, local whatever college. That's bifurcating our society because if you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. Okay. And part of what uh, this world works on is relationship capital. I was offended recently. A friend of mine who well-meaning called me and said he wanted to do something to help black America. And so he wanted to create some internships. So he said, John, get me four, 20 candidates and I'll pick four. And I said, the hell I will. I'm not doing that for you. And he said, well, what, what, what's wrong? I said, that's not the way the world works. I said, the way the world works is your biggest investor calls you. He runs an investment company and says, hey, my piece of crap, lazy cousin, a nephew, he really just says my nephew. Uh, but it was really my lazy nephew needs a summer job. <laughs> Can you give him an internship? And of course, the guy goes, well, of course we will. What's his name? What school did he go to? He asked some perfunctory questions. But when your, when your biggest investor calls you, you just say yes. And I said to this guy, that's the way the world works, right? That kid's going to get that shot, not because they're brilliant, but because their daddy is your investor, but you're going to tell them the folks I bring to you are probably 10 times smarter than that kid, that they got an interview and 16 of them will get a decline and four of them will get a, a beat pick. No, 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 we're not doing that. So finally, he said, John, just bring me one you like. <laughs> so he did that to shut me up. But 
and but he but he called back then, Dan, and said, you know what? I want a hundred in no, I don't want yeah. I want a yeah. hundred interns. We're, we're gonna mobilize our whole community. So he got it, the light came on. So so it, internships for all. I want I want public, I want the government to give tax incentives for corporations to bring on massive internships at scale, massive apprenticeships at scale, because the ladder is broken. I grew up in Compton, California. The only skyscraper in Compton, Dan, was the courthouse. Mm. So how am I supposed to find, find Dan Schumann? Yeah. How, how am I going to ever meet you? How am I going to ever meet Silicon Valley? I don't care. I'll become a drug dealer, not an entrepreneur, no matter how smart, because I, my relationship capital is all screwed up. So internships and, and apprenticeships are those gateways that allow people to ascend. Um, we don't have time for the whole, the whole plan, but it's financial literacy for all, access to capital for all, which is what yeah. you've done. It's yeah. part of your plan. We got to provide C coin and equity, C coin and equity to small businesses and 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 and, and dreamers at a very small size. To, uh, we have a business, a company, a, a program at Operation Hope, where we, if if you pitch your business idea, take a financial literacy course, uh, come up with a business plan, and you're in middle school, you go on stage and you pitch your idea for two minutes. It takes a lot of hoops, but, uh We have judges there. We'll fund you up to five hundred bucks to start a business as an eighth grader. Well, Dan, that's why I am who I am. Who I am. A banker came in my classroom when I was nine years old and taught me financial literacy. And I said to him, "Sir, what do you do for a living? And how do you get rich legally?" <laughs> uh, I, I was I was completely serious. Like I never seen my a white man with a suit and tie far. on, a nice car in the parking lot. The last white guy I knew with a suit on was a detective, but it was a really bad, crappy suit. This guy was clean. He said, I'm a banker and I finance entrepreneurs. I said, sir, I don't know what an entrepreneur is, but if you're financing them and it's legal, I'm going to be one. What would have happened then if that white banker hadn't come in my classroom? Mm -hmm. That was Community Reinvestment Act, 1977. He had to come and do community service because he was an FDIC-insured bank, taught me financial literacy. The class doesn't exist anymore, home economics. What would have happened? My whole, I wouldn't be talking to you. I wouldn't be employing 400 people. I would not have advised three presidents and honored by five and known eight or whatever the credential people want to get. I would just be a guy either dead or probably selling drugs someplace because that's the only big business that I could have access to. See, we model what we see. And yeah. I want to give America at scale something different to see and something different to do. Because I believe that the bottom of this pyramid, 100 million Americans are the, the bench strength for the playoff games of the rest of our lives. These 100 million Americans are the new Dan Schulman. Yeah, it's inspiring. John, I got one more question for you, because this has been such a great conversation that we've been having. So here's the, the question I've got for you. And you talked a little bit about this, but like... When you talk about the bench strength and you talk about the next, you know, uh, athletes for the future, you know, for, for our uh, society, and our economy, all athletes, no matter what sport you play, um, have triumphs and they are also knocked down. I mean, it happens. It's impossible for it not to happen. But you know what? kind of getting back up on your feet can define who you are and it can also break it as well. Yeah. And I'm really curious, John, I know people who are listening and see the success you've had and the stories that you've uh, mentioned on how you're growing up is how did you find that inner fortitude to keep going and to not let kind of circumstances bring you down? And I'm like, I think, that would be a great way to end our conversation. Yeah. So first of all, we got to do a, a, a part two of this at some point. This has been one of the most important discussions I've ever had with anybody. Um, I don't know how we got here, but it's been rich. Um, yeah. and, and I thank you for doing this, Dan. Uh, so, so first of all, the question you didn't ask, which is what can corporate American leaders like you do? Um, I think what you can do is use your what you've done. Use your budget. Yeah. That's your balance sheet. That's your oh, investors get freaked. Use your budget, your annual budget. Who am I contracting with? Who's my sanitation company? Who's my 
you know, maintenance company? What, what minority vendors do we use? You know, what's, where do my internships come from? You know, uh, who is uh, cleaning? I mean, look, look at every part of your budget and see if you can take, I don't know, 20% of it and reimagine its use. Not spend any more. Redirect it. Uh, and because 90% of our jobs in America are private sector jobs, not the government. Yep. So it's the private sector, no different than during the civil rights movement when that Andrew Young, Dr. King would, would shut down the city with marches and he would send Andrew Young quietly to meet with business leaders to cut a deal to get the whites only signs down. So it was the private sector that broke the back of discrimination and racism in the South in the 60s. It's going to be the private sector that sets the tone today. And I'd love to see a hundred of you get together in a coalition of the willing to push for financial literacy for all and push internship for all and apprenticeships for all. And some of these, what I call low hanging fruit, easy things that are just good for America. Okay. Your question. Um, that's By the way, I love all those comments, John. I just want to like come in and say, uh, it is a great inspiring call. Yeah, and I'm talking to you. I'm talking to yep. uh, Doug McMillan at Walmart and, Usher, and, and Tony Resser and a bunch of others, and hopefully it'll get traction. Um, but you and me had something in common. Parents. My mother told me she loved me every day of my life. Nothing more powerful than being told that you are loved. What happened in slavery? You're told you ain't nothing. You ain't, you, you, I, I can't use the words I want to use here, but your viewers will understand. You ain't nothing. You'll never be nothing because they needed to break the spirit of the, of the enslaved so they did not overtake the overseers. So they needed their hands. They needed their body, the confidence, but they didn't, need, but they didn't want the self-esteem. So we have broken self-esteem in best case scenario in black America, high confidence, which comes from competence, but that's externally generated. But we have low self-esteem, which then breeds insecurity. Yeah, yeah. And that low self-esteem when the insecurity is what happens. So that's why we're ultra sensitive to slights and how we can get uh, sort of easily uh, unhopeful. And the reason I like credit scores, yes, I said credit scores. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or, and, and PayPal has a new technology, that you, a new way you're doing it. And I commend you for that. But whatever, whatever you call credit worthiness, the reason I like yeah. it is it's not somebody else's uh, control over me. If I can raise my credit score through Operation Hope because of an error on my credit report, 40 points, and get that removed, get it popped 40 points from 570 to 610, my self esteem goes up, goes up, my confidence goes up, Absolutely. my trust in the system, my belief. My access, my cost of funds. If I can get my credit score up to 670, 680, all of a sudden the world opens up. Now I'm hopeful again. If I can get it above 700, now I'm talking about maybe writing checks as an entrepreneur, not cashing checks as an employer. The endorphins start kicking in the right side of my brain in a different way. I know this sounds crazy, Dan, but if we can get credit scores up 100 points, community by community, 90% of our problems go away because... You, the vibration of those communities, economic vibration, the, the intentionality, the hopefulness, the, it, the, it, it, it creates a self-propelling uh, matrix. You don't see riots in 700 credit score neighborhoods. It's never happened in the history of America. And the cynic would say, no, I just saw a riot in 700 credit score. No, you saw a riot through a 700 credit score neighborhood. And that's where the shops were. You didn't see a riot in a 700 credit score neighborhood. So 570 credit score neighborhoods are where all of our negative problems are homicides, dropout rates, high school education, black and white, uh, uh, check cash or payday loan lender, rental home stores, title lenders, bigger stores, eating on this financial ignorance and low hope. So we can get the economic vibration up, you get the access up, the opportunity up, and all of a sudden the lights come on in America. So uh, I, we have got to find a way to be better role model. We have, we have failed as public parents, our public office holders are failing our children as role models. Watch how you live your life. Maybe the only Bible anybody else reads. We cannot have an economic presidency. You, you have to have a moral leader, a, a somebody who people who it, they, they take their cues from, a, who I want to be when I grow up, how I want to behave, how I want to comport myself, how I want to treat other people, right? Because that becomes infectious. And if I'm a brute, then maybe you'll be a brute too. And all of a sudden now it becomes normal to be a brute. I mean, people are actually pretty basic, Dan. Yeah. They model what they 
Yeah, but they see what they grew up. Yeah, so I think that that culture, I'll end with this. The reason I'm so hopeful is when I say I want to eradicate poverty, I don't mean physical poverty. I mean culture poverty. And culture, you have a culture in your home. You have a culture in your business that you've set, which I love at PayPal. We have a culture on, on your block, in your neighborhood. What kind of culture are we nurturing, man? Culture is not the most important thing. It's the only thing. So that's why I think we can save this and solve this. That's why Dr. King, one man with 70 employees and a $600,000 budget, mm. changed the world and, and eradicated us of almost 100 years of ignorance without firing a shot. I'm hopeful, man. Yeah. I'm hopeful. Yeah. John, we got to stop here. But as you said, you and I could have this conversation easy for hours and hours. Um, And our work is never done. But it's because we're inspired because we are hopeful. And uh, because we know we know we actually can make a difference. And to me, that is sort of, you know, it's a one thing at a time, one step forward at a time. But um, we start to combine those together. It can make a large impact. And uh, and I'm grateful uh, for the things that you're doing. Uh, I'm grateful we have this conversation. You are a good man uh, and a good for friend. You. And I really appreciate it. John O'Brien, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And please give Dan the gift. Everybody watching this, give him the gift of scale. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are. Scale it. That's how we solve this. Scale it. Thank you. John, take care. Peace and light. To you too, my friend.